One thing I'm sure of, Mike. You're going to like this fellow. His name is Jim Donaldson. He's a big, raw-boned country boy and has an uncanny knack of handling wild animals. There's just one thing I want to warn you about. Jim is slightly gun-shy. Not in the usual way. He just doesn't like to pull triggers. He prefers to convince them with his bare hands. And that goes for anything from a jackrabbit to a rhinoceros. And that's what I like about him. He's a zoologist and not a killer. I won't be there to bring him back alive. So it's up to you to send him back alive. You know, or at least I know, that anything can happen in the jungle. Hello. Yes, he is. Mr. Donaldson again. All right, let me have it. Hello? Oh, hello, Jim. Yes, I'm just finishing it. Oh, you haven't a worry in the world. No, no, no. He'd be delighted that you're taking my place. I know it, Jim, but I can't be in Washington and at the same time. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I'll read you what I've written. Give me that page that uh, you typed, will you please, Miss Wilson? Here you are, Jim. Uh, Mr. Miguel Rodzinski, Belang, Brazil. Dear Mike, been up against something solid, and I've got bad news for you. The check up the Amazon we planned is off, at least for me. I waited to the last minute to tell you because I knew how disappointed you'd be. But Uncle Sam comes first, and I've got to stick around where I'll be handy. But now I've got some good news for you. As a young fellow, a protege of mine, I'm sending in my place. I know you'll treat him exactly as you would me. And you'll get a kick out of his enthusiasm and the way he tackles his job. Yeah, oh, that'll be all right. Now, the rest of the letter, Jimmy, is not important. It's just a sales talk about you. And I know you'll live up to it. Now, calm down and no more telephone calls. What? Oh, the money and the tickets. Oh, Miss Wilson will bring those over to you. And by the way, Jim, since you're taking my tickets and my money and my trip, let's make a clean sweep of it. I'm going to give you that ring of mine that you've been admiring. And I hope it brings you the same good luck it's always brought me. You just keep your eyes open and your mouth shut and listen to Mike. He knows all the answers that you think you know. I'll be down here to see you off. Goodbye. Uh, finish that, Miss Wilson. I'll sign it we'll get it off by air mail. <laughs> I envy that boy. My letter to Mike Rodzinski goes on its way from New York to Brazil, our great sister republic, largest of all South American countries. Full of a strange exotic beauty, Brazil has an area of more than three and a quarter million square miles. Chief coffee producer of the world, Brazil is also abundant in gold, rice, cotton, sugar, and tobacco. More importantly, Brazil is bound to the United States by ties of culture and governmental brotherhood. Good neighborliness is more than an empty phrase, and friendship has a real meaning. The principal city is famed Rio de Janeiro, capital of the nation, and capital also of fun and frolic, gaiety and glamour. My letter, however, is not flying down to Rio. It flies instead to Belang. The land lies at the mouth of the Amazon like a jewel in velvet. The city is bound on one side by the jungle, on another by the sea, and on a third by the Amazon itself. The sea and the river slash at the borders of the town like knives, and the jungle, fierce as any wild animal, forever raids its boundaries. These are some of the natives of Belang part of Brazil's 46 million friendly people.
Mike Krajinski's home. The Villa Mina, named for his wife, with a postman bringing my letter. Mike's houseboy meets the postman. The letter is destined to send Jimmy Donaldson into conflict with the jungle, into hand-to-hand -hand fighting with Red Anaconda and ferocious Jacare. Rajinsky himself comes out. Mike is not a large man, but he's hard as nails, and he has a way with animals. As Mike reads the letter, his wife and daughter join him. Preparations for the adventure must be made. Native boys must be sent ahead into the jungle to establish a camp. Transportation must be arranged for. The ship comes into harbor, and there's Jim Donaldson, the big fellow on the left, with Clyde and associates, who also happens to be a friend of Rodinsky's. The waterfront, alive with activity. A fleet of river cargo boats. These picturesque craft play an important role. Jim, of course, is excited over the great variety of bird life. Even Mike, to whom this trip is something of an old story, feels his pulse quicken. A rare crested blue heron alights, and egrets are everywhere. The plumage of these rare and beautiful birds is protected by government decree. Now in quiet waters, waters so still they hold no hint of danger, they come to the jungle's edge. Mike leaps ashore, and Jim, for the first time, Set for the mysterious, the fierce, the untamed. An exciting week passes for Jimmy. Guided by Mike, he has found the jungle overpowering in interest. And already, he has accumulated a sizable collection of small animals and a few birds. As he returns to camp with Mike for a brief expedition into the underbrush, the native boys are preparing a meal. A man develops a good appetite in the jungle, and he needs his three square meals a day with plenty of vitamins. Here are a couple of Jimmy's catches, already accustomed to captivity, Jim and Mike sit down and the native boys serve them. They will eat farini, made from mandioca root, and various meats roasted on skewers and spits. The food is wholesome, healthy, and sustaining. And eating outdoors, as every boy scout knows, always seems better than eating in stuffy rooms. And this is a part of the floor show. Most of the camp monkeys would like to join in the feast. But these fellows are more interested in monkey business. The natives do not use knives and forks, feeding themselves with their fingers, much as the Hawaiians do when they eat poi. Wilbur, a woolly monkey, has become the camp pet, and he's philosopher enough not to mind his chain. Mike and Jim, you'll observe, haven't yet acquired the hand-to-mouth technique. In a jungle, fine feathers do make fine birds. A native boy feeds the monkey. A rare white-mustached marmosette. The woolly again, solving the mystery of an orange. What Wilbur lacks in manners, he makes up in enthusiastic appetite. The South American woolly monkey makes the best of all pets. 
They're gentle and intelligent, and eventually become very affectionate. An older native boy, handsome and intelligent. And a parrot who apparently has nothing to say. As the boys finished their meal, Jim and Mike, in a hurry to get back into the jungle, prepared to set out once more. Here's Wilbur forgetting his manners again. Uh, these McCallers are probably saying, careful Wilbur, you'll get the gout eating that rich human food. A young boa constrictor, but well, too young to be dangerous. He's got it. Jimmy and Mike are now in the very heart of the jungle, in a dense tangle of brush and trees and vines as wild as dark as Africa. A family of tapers browsing. Mother. Baby and father. Ah, another woolly, perhaps one of Wilbur's cousins. He'll scream a cry of warning to the tapers if Jim and Mike get too close. <laughs> Baby tapers, whether of the South American or the Malayan variety, are always striped changing color and losing their stripes as they grow older. Tapers are the only animals evolution hasn't changed. They're the same today as they were 12 million years ago, the oldest living creatures on the face of the earth. Jim is fascinated. He'd like to capture this fine group, but he knows the Brazilian government protects the taper. Reluctantly, Jimmy goes, and Mike follows. And is Mr. Woolley really? Uh, good riddance, he says. He doesn't know it, but before long, he'll probably join Cousin Wilbur at the camp and like it. These are iguanas, large South American lizards. Full grown, they are sometimes six feet in length. How would you like to have an iguana steak for dinner? As the iguana climbs the tree, he may not look very appetizing, but the natives love them broiled. Jim and Mike want this particular specimen for their collection. With long poles and a wire noose, they bring him down. The operation is not as easy as it looks. One false move and a man might lose a finger. Armor plated from head to tail. An ugly customer with vice-like jaws. This is the coat of money, a distant cousin of the raccoon family. He doesn't look particularly vicious, but his claws are sharp and his teeth can bite through a board. Jimmy and Mike see him, and they'd like to capture him. That boa constrictor also sees him, and he has the same idea. And he's a brave little fellow with more courage than good sense.
Well, they saved him, and just in time. Money is full of life now, and on his way to join the camp collection. Jim decides to go exploring without Mike. Up the Amazon he goes, past trees and vines, and foliage woven by nature into strange and beautiful patterns and designs. This is the jungle, as yet unconquered by mankind. As he paddles along with a native boy, he sees a harpy eagle. This beautiful bird is one of the rarest of its kind. His talons are powerful, one of the largest of the eagle family. He is by far the fiercest of the lot. He kills, of course, only when he's hungry. But he's hungry often. With razor-sharp beak and cold, piercing eye, he appears exactly what he is, the tiger of the air. Jimmy catalogs him for future reference. His Majesty in person. How only a queen vulture could fall in love with a face like that. Jimmy goes on his way, not knowing he is destined to meet the anaconda and feel the grip of its deadly coil. Jim and Mike are out in the brush again. Another one of those snooping woolies, pot-bellied and hungry as usual. Nearby, a pair of Jabru storks, minding their own business, they preen themselves in the sun. They're beautiful, as all wild birds are. And though they're native to Brazil, they're sometimes found as far north as the Rio Grande. Behind their mild exterior is a ferocious pride. A small anaconda on the prowl invades their sanctuary. Another anaconda will never grow up. Two precarious are wild pigs. These little animals don't like anything, not even themselves. They start fighting, probably because they've got nothing else to do. It's only a family squabble, but it gives Jimmy his chance. While father and mother do battle, he gets it. jungle next day, Jim and Mike catch sight of a curious creature, a giant anteater, one of nature's oddities. Like nearly everything else in the jungle, he apparently is looking for trouble as he invades the privacy of another anteater's home. This is the lady of the house with her baby on her back. The fur of the giant anteater is feather-like, and nature's camouflage lends the animal with the surrounding foliage. Jim is all for making a quick capture, but why is old Mike? Suggest they take their time, for there may be a fight. And when it's over, both animals may be easily caught. Sure enough, as the mother moves away, the head of the family, old Snazola himself, comes out to meet the intruder. Harmless as the anteater appears to be, 
He has a strong, cat-like set of claws, nearly an inch long. It's hard to say whether they're really mad or just a couple of jungle jitterbugs. It's a draw. The lady in the case doesn't seem interested in either gladiator, but Jim and Mike are. As the fighters call it quits, which means a moral victory for Schnazola, they move in. Two men head for camp and are joined by the boy. As the anteaters are caged, Mickey the monk shatters an excited greeting to the new guest. Feeling the need of jungle refreshment, Mike and the native boy start out after coconut. The milk of the coconut is the finest and safest drink in the jungle. Taking a green palm leaf, the boy leaves the rope, which he makes into a hobble. Use the hobble to bind his feet together while he climbs the coconut tree. Up he goes. The hobble making it easy for him to grip the tree trunk firmly. A jungle telephone lineman with only a palm leaf rope to keep him from falling. I wonder how many of our best athletes, equipped only with such a contrivance, could make a climb like this. Down come the coconuts, and down comes the boy, sliding easily, the soles of his feet as rough and as tough as sandpaper. Gathering the coconuts, they carry them back to camp. This is a water buffalo. He's not a native of Brazil. He looks peaceful enough, but behind that placid exterior is a fighting heart and a bad disposition. Jim and one of the boys discover him emerging from an afternoon siesta in the muddy waters of a swamp. These are alligators. They flourish in the Amazon Delta, and the buffalo makes up his mind, he'll have to get off his reservation. Scram, he says.
that's that. Evidently, the buffalo wants to be alone. But the sounds of the fight between the alligators and the buffalo have attracted the attention of a female jaguar who comes out to defend her cub. The cubs are hiding in the nearby underbrush. the entire jungle to himself. Screams of the jaguar bring the boys on the run. Jagger has had enough. The buffalo is still a champion. Back he goes to his corner. If he had a portable microphone, he'd probably say, Hello, Ma, I swell. Caught by the neck and all four legs, Jagger struggles and snarls in helpless fury. Jim and a native boy heard the animal's cries and hurried to the scene. Spread eagled and a little from its fight with the buffalo, the jaguar is all crushed up with only one place to go, the camp. Here's old Sourpuss the champ, sitting in nature's bathtub. He's still grouchy. He may not know it, but his turn will come back to camp with another prize. Mike wants to meet Jimmy, who is very proud of his catch. Jaggers are not often so easily taken. Mickey the Monk greets the new arrival with a Brazilian equivalent of a Bronx cheer. Into a nice clean cage, the jagger goes, to be cared for by human hands. But the boys are careful of those claws and teeth. Here are the orphan babies. Jim and Mike return to search for them but did not succeed in catching them until late that night. The black one is a very rare specimen. The ratio of black jaguars is only about one in 10,000. After a job like that, a drink is in order. With his machete, Mike slices a coconut. The coconut is an example of nature's form of insulated refrigeration, exposed to the hot tropical sun of 120 degrees or more. The green husk, which covers the hard shell of the coconut, keeps the milk inside as cool as if it had just come out of an ice box. Wilbur bides his time, his eye on Jimmy and the coconut. His thirst quenched, Jimmy has a little fun with a spider monkey. These monkeys are temperamental and hard to handle. Regular jungle prima donnas with a great sense of their own importance. Get away from me, big boy. You bother me, he says. Pretty well annoyed, the grouchy monkey puts an end to Jimmy's fun by knocking his hat off. Then gone, Wilbur looks the drink situation over. He decides to have a few on the house. He drinks monkey fashion, cupping the milk in his hands and having the time of life. The monkeys can do a lot of things that men can do, but they can't open a coconut. Clyde.
bride who was going to get a permit to visit Zachary land hasn't arrived. Something may have happened to him. Mike decides to make a trip to the nearest village where he can send a message to Belang. With native boys, he starts out across the lagoon, thick with water lilies. And in a tree, the anaconda waits, the devil himself. Jim now does a foolhardy thing. He takes off his gun. And a gun in the jungle is more important to a man than water in the desert. On a nearby vine, a butterfly pauses in its flight. The serpent coils and waits. Jim comes through the vines unsuspecting, nearer and nearer to the deadly coil. Look out, Jimmy. Hold that head, hold it. Mike hears Jimmy's cries for help. Jim is black in the face, almost done for. Many of the serpent's teeth have broken off in Jim's arm. Mike knows what to do. close shave. Few men have been caught in the coils of an anaconda and lived to tell about it. Jim explains how it happened. He chased a harmless little butterfly and nearly lost his life. Great trees with graceful sweeping roots above ground are indigenous to all jungle countries. And this one is a particularly fine specimen. His bare trunk is topped by wide branches in which we find a black, white, and yellow toucan, whose beauty is offset by a regular Jimmy Durante beak. He'd be in a bad way if he ever developed sinus trouble. Clyde arrives at last with permits for the expedition to visit the land where Jacare holds sway. Native guides, Clyde and Paul's Mike, will join the party further up the river. As the party moves on, Jimmy sees something in a tree and decides to take a closer look. Two crab-eating raccoons, cute little fellows, with needle-like teeth, take a bird's-eye view of the world. Mike and Clyde watch while Jimmy does a little single-handed animal catching. And they do a little jungle necking, unaware of the approaching man.
falls along the branch, talking gently in persuasive tones, but he doesn't seem to speak their language. Victory comes, and then he attacks from the rear. The raccoons hadn't counted on that. Dumb animals are really not dumb at all, but man can usually outsmart all of them. valuable specimens. As they're put into the cage, we know they'll be safer in captivity than they ever could have been in the jungle. They no longer need to fear the anaconda, the boa constrictor, or the jaguar. South American armadillo is nature's conception of an army tank in miniature. Consciously or unconsciously, humanity imitates nature, which is at part. Submarines are like whales. Planes, of course, are like birds. And when Da Vinci, the great painter and inventor, designed the first tank centuries ago, he may well have drawn his inspiration from the armadillo. armadillo at close range. Note its coat of mail, tough and heavy. Adequate protection against the ocelot, the harpy eagle, and other natural enemies. Magnify the animal a thousand times, and you have a denizen of the jungle of 10 million years ago. The nest is full of babies. Armadillos believe in large families. rodent in the world is the South American capybara. These are young ones, though they look something like guinea pigs. When they're full grown, they often reach a length of four feet. And being rodents are sometimes referred to as giant rats. The men rob the nest. Here comes the mother. She's anything but handsome to the human eye. Jim throws a rope, but misses. Disconcerted, she runs the wrong way. And now he's caught her. knotted in such a manner as to prevent the animal from strangling. Again, the carts give way to a boat, and the expedition heads up the river towards Jacare land. Now the jungle is dense, and the terrain flat and swampy. have joined the party bringing horses. Horses must be used as a means of transportation because boats and carts are impractical for long journeys in this part of the Amazon country, which is half land and half water. The native carrying the tree branch uses it to brush away flies. Crossing lakes and small streams, the expedition comes at last 
the domain of the great killer, Shakaray. Here, the anaconda itself never dares venture. Here, the jaguar keeps its distance. And even the water buffalo, as tough as he is, able to rout the alligator or almost anything else, stays out of sight. word with the chief guide and bids him goodbye. Then calling the boys, he gets into a long dugout canoe. The canoe may look ungainly, but it maneuvers well in the shallow water. It has to. Chief guide, as a mark of friendship for these North Americans, lends his high-powered rifle to Clyde. In an emergency, you can't defend yourself against Chakaray with a pop gun. The guides move down the river, leaving Jimmy and his companions face Jacaray in the death-infested waters of the Amazon. This is Jacaray land, and there, lying in the mud and slime of the riverbank, is Jacaray. His common name is Canaan. Brazilians who call him Jacaray know that his real name is Murderer. Jacare's strength is almost unbelievable, and his hungry jaws devour any living thing that they can reach. Look at that death's head, horrible but fascinating. You wonder in what ancient nightmare of nature the idea of this beast was born. There must be a reason for every form of life, but no one has yet discovered a satisfactory reason for Jacare. He's something out of Earth's dim dawn, like something created long before mankind was given a soul. There they lie, dreaming dreams of death and destruction. If people are sometimes like animals, then animals are also like people. But what sort of people are these monsters like? They catch the smell of human flesh. It excites them to frenzy. Their small brains fuming with hate as they fight among themselves. Even now, they give no quarter and ask none. Killing is all they think about, all they know, all they live for. Most wild creatures kill only to eat, but Jacare loves murder for murder's sake and thrives on it. Here is Jacare in the stream, swimming toward the dugout. swims to the attack. He too is roped. He fights, and it's difficult to say whether he wants to escape or kill the men. What furious hates and fears must throb in his angry brain, as unwittingly, 
He wraps the rope round and round him, playing the game just as the men want him to, binding himself tighter and tighter. The monster is hauled in, thrashing and twisting, angry and defiant. The jaws of death. They clamp those jaws shut with a stick and tie them securely. And now you see a strange thing. The boy presses the monster's eyelids with his fingers and Jacare is helpless. A strange peculiarity of these reptiles is that when they cannot see, they give up the fight. And so the boys can tie him securely without fear of injury. Zachary's weight is immense, up to half a ton, and his tail is a weapon as well as a rudder, almost as dangerous as his teeth. A monster smelling man meat slides into the stream. The killer half hidden in the water waits. dare not fire, he might hit Jimmy. Another monster enters the water, and this time, Clyde does fire, stopping him cold. Jimmy fights for his life. His knife flashes. It's over. Almost exhausted, Jimmy swims toward the dugout, and Jacare slowly sinks to his death in the mud of the river bottom. monsters, the boat goes on its way. There they are, killers of the Amazon, who will kill no more. And with them is Jimmy, who faced Jacare in his native element, fought him to the death, and lived to tell the tale. Jim and Mike inspect the birds and animals making sure that all are well caged for the trip home. Mickey the monk playing a jungle serenade on a slice of watermelon. It's a remarkable thing, watermelon and corn on the cob are two kinds of food everybody eats the same way, including monkeys. Mickey does a few tricks on the bar while he eats, proving his versatility and acrobatic skill.
no slot. Jim plays with his sleek and slender animals. Quite a fighter in his own right. If music hath charm to soothe the savage beast, so also has kindness. the Woolly has finally found the solution to the orange problem. Here's the jaguar which fought so valiantly against the water buffalo in defense of its cubs. And here's one of her cubs, now playful as a kitten. Here's the rare and beautiful black one. They've been tamed through Jimmy's gentleness and care. His kindness has won them over. Even in the jungle, kindness pays dividends. And now the adventurers leave the wilds and push downstream towards civilization. It's beautiful here, but only creatures of the wild can live in the wilds forever. chance, caught at last. He might have been able to whip anything in the jungle, but he just wasn't good enough to defeat Jim and Mike. Onto the boat he's hoisted. No more wallowing in muddy waters. No more challenging the world. He's headed for a nice, clean, comfortable zoo now, where he'll dream the hours away thinking of his victories. Down the Amazon toward Belang, on a large riverboat, Jim, Mike, Clyde, and the animals. A gray sail in the sunset. And Belang again, where the men go ashore and the animals are transferred from a riverboat to a steamer. Here he comes, the reincarnation of Jack the Ripper. And there he goes, harmless as a bale of rubber. Goodbye now to Brazil, friendly nation of friendly people, symbolized in the person of Mike Brzezinski. Jim glances at my ring. Perhaps the ring is lucky. Perhaps it did save his life. Perhaps, too, it is a symbol that unity which today binds Brazil and her sister South American nations to all of North America. Mike takes the ring in the spirit in which it is given, the spirit of common aspiration and purpose, which makes the entire Western world a brotherhood in freedom. Mike waves to the dock. Jim's ship pulls out, and Jimmy, you may be sure, leaves regretfully. It has been a great adventure for Jimmy, and it's made me just a little bit homesick for the jungle. I have been to all the jungles of the earth, and brought back many a wild cargo, and I'll do it again. I guess I'll always be bringing them back alive. Oh.